Coconuts TV. We had to crawl over stacks of fallen trees to get to the still smoking area. Did you get that? <laughs> the ground underneath was soft, wet ash. Look how far my feet went down because I missed the branch and stepped directly into the soil. The Muslim call to prayer from a local mosque echoed through the air as we approached the fire. After 30 minutes of fighting through the brush, we made it to the burning area and set up for a shot. The burned out landscape was surreal. Being close to even this relatively small amount of smoke for 15 minutes irritated our eyes and throats. The smoke is kind of blowing directly into my face and I'm inhaling it. It feels awful. I wouldn't want to live near here. I pretty much want to leave as quickly as possible. I've noticed as well that it seems like pretty much everyone has a cough in Sumatra and I can't help but feel that smoke like this has a lot to do with that. Uh, oftentimes Singapore and Malaysia point the finger at and really blame Indonesia for the haze in their countries. Uh, it's certainly caused by forest fires in Sumatra generally but those forest fires are very often, a majority of the time, made to clear forests to produce palm oil. That was uh, interesting, to say the least. Right next to the plot of smoldering forest, we found a little dirt floor roadside shack that was home to a mother and her baby. Langsung pada pada orang yang punya punya kebun pada ini kalau turun madami terus sampai api itu nyemerang mereka mereka pulang dari kerja pada nggak tahan kabut asap kabut ini apa hitam hitam itu pada keluar semua jadi sekarang sampai sekarang masih api itu terlalu tebal ya mungkin api itu kan waktu itu panas kayak berkilat kilat itu mungkin api itu dari bawah itu jadi kalau kalau lagi ada angin besar itu besar api itu naik naik pohon kayu di sini aku tak, aku keluarlah nyemerang ke sana aku takut api kan di sebelah sini udah mau masuk ke sini aku keluar ngajak anak saya anak saya pada oh, pernah apa punya ini anak saya umur dua bulan setengah ini sekarang tiga bulan anak saya pada susah napasnya sampai malam itu sampai tidur panas saya juga panas lagi api itu kan pada siang lagi sampai tiga hari panas enggak kita orang enggak punya jadi mandi sampai empat kali satu malam mandinya kita orang enggak punya makan pun lagi susah sekarang kan kemarau tanaman enggak ada yang panen kita sini merantau saudara nggak ada siapa siapa pun nggak ada sampai sekarang masih merah merah dari untuk kebakan timbul kayak udang masa itu nah ini masih masih sedikit sedikit yang dari kebakaran itu sampai uap panas itu keluar habis di panas itu masih merah merah sedikit tapi nggak ini waktu itu penuh badannya enggak kalau sebelum kebakaran nggak ada yang merah merah anak saya juga orang-orang belakang itu juga kayak gitu juga yang udah pacak jalan itu The next day in South Sumatra we went to see firsthand the situation on a working palm oil plantation. Our fixers from Greenpeace and Walhi said that the plantation owner and the local community were currently in a dispute over some of the plantation land. Because we were technically trespassing, we cannot reveal the owner of the plantation. So we are here in a large-scale palm oil plantation in South Sumatra, Indonesia. This land used to be peat forest and it was cleared uh, to create this palm oil plantation, most likely by burning. 
We have trespassed and snuck onto this plantation to see for ourselves what the palm oil production industry is like. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk to a couple local farmers who work on this plantation and see what they're doing uh, for the harvesting and the production of palm oil. Some female plantation workers were gathering up loose palm oil kernels from the trees and the ground. We were able to round up a few for a chat. They said that they were paid by weight now rather than by day and that they earned about 300,000 rupiah per month or 30 US dollars. Sekarung itu cuma tiga ribu, jadi kalau permakan untuk belanja anak, ya cukuplah. Nah, ngeras ke tulang baru itu, panak lemak itu. Tidak kejar nih, bagi habis itu boleh dari karung itu, kalau buah kan nggak mengawur sewek, Bapak. Tidak perlu ada. Selorong ini kalau buah ada kati, paling ada seember ini. Nah. Selorong dari sana ke sana, ter lagi. Kalau buah banyak, ya boleh masih. Itulah kami buntu, anu tu hakahan kalau baca. Gaji itu bulanan, sebulan sekali digaji. As we finished up the interview with the plantation laborers, we were told that trucks were coming soon to collect the kernels left by the road. It was time for us to go. So a truck just rolled by as we were interviewing these women who are working here picking up the palm oil kernels. Uh, we're told that they, the truck that came by could tell the guard center that we're here shooting, so we're gonna leave. It's time to go. <laughs> The palm oil debate roughly pits those in favor of more regulations, generally environmental groups, against those who are happy with the way things are, generally corporations. Around the same time we were in Sumatra, a group called the RSPO, or the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil, was having its big annual meeting in Kuala Lumpur. The RSPO is kind of like the United Nations of palm oil. It was started in 2004 when the environmental groups and corporations agreed to sit down together and actually talk about how to make things better. To have a seat at the table and get their palm oil RSPO certified, companies must pledge to meet certain criteria, such as refraining from clearing virgin forest. This, of course, made the environmental groups happier, and it was great PR for the companies. Now they could say, hey, we're not evil, we're part of the RSPO. In the decades since the group's creation, however, deforestation for palm oil has only gotten exponentially worse. Critics have accused the RSPO of not even enforcing its own membership requirements. And in 2013, Greenpeace even released maps which showed fires on land owned by three major member companies, Jatim Jaya Perkasa, Saim Darby, and Wilmar International. At the 2014 meeting, the RSPO acknowledged its shortcomings and promised to expel members that didn't follow the rules in the future. We should mention as well that Wilmar and Cargill have recently launched splashy initiatives aimed at cleaning up deforestation-linked palm oil from their production. While that all sounds great, it's hard not to be skeptical. With complex supply chains, webs of companies, rampant laundering of dirty palm oil, and Indonesia's corrupt law enforcement. We contacted over a dozen of the biggest companies, asking them to go on record for this documentary, including Wilmar, Musim Mas, and Cargill. No one would give us an interview. 2013 was the worst year on record for fires in Sumatra. On the PR front, the RSPO recently commissioned an impressive online multimedia sponsored feature about palm oil in The Guardian, the same newspaper that had reported on failures of the organization just a year earlier. The report did focus on deforestation, but seemed to conclude that there was absolutely no viable commercial alternative to palm oil. It's true, though, that the palm produces a pretty amazing vegetable oil. Palm oil yields per hectare are about 10 times that of soybean oil, with significantly less energy, pesticides, and fertilizers required to farm it. 
Palm oil plantations by themselves aren't the problem. It's the slash and burn deforestation, especially on peatlands, that is. Dutch conservation scientist Eric Majard is known for his pragmatic and outspoken views on palm oil. We caught up with him for an interview in Jakarta. I write a lot for, for newspapers about issues. I mean, people have very um, preconceived ideas about conservation and it seems to be um, almost like a religious belief where you're either very much against or very much in favor of something. Uh, my issue with oil palm, I mean, there's, there's no doubt oil palm has a really bad impact on the environment, um, both the, the biological as well as the social environment. Um, my issue is more that we have for decades been saying that oil palm is bad, is evil, should not happen, uh, whilst we're saying that the, uh, the industry is expanding. Um, and, and as long as we keep ourselves on that opposing side, there is very little room for collaboration with the industry to actually try to improve practices because um, it becomes increasingly clear that oil palm is not going to go away. Um, oil palm is, um, is expanding in, um, in Asia as we speak, but it's expanding in Africa, it's expanding in, in South America. And it's, uh, it's really high time that we find some way of uh, developing the kind of oil palm that is, um, that is more acceptable um, to, um, uh, to local people as well, to, uh, to people that care about the environment. Uh, obviously, one of the big problems is oil palm is, is going into areas that were previously um, forested, and uh, tropical rainforest. And if you compare the, not just the biodiversity of a tropical rainforest, but also the services that come out of a tropical rainforest, for instance, um, uh, the, the flood buffering functions of, uh, of, of peat swamp forest, compare that to, to oil palm, um, oil palm has, has far less value for that. So if you cut down a rainforest and put an oil palm plantation instead, that is a big environmental problem. So one of the big things for oil palm is to find uh, the kind of oil palm that doesn't require deforestation. So that would be a really important first step. I think in general, oil palm development on peat with all the associated problems of, uh, of peat burning, peat is not a soil, peat, peat will eventually just disappear. It may take one or two decades, but in the end you end up with a co completely unproductive um, wasteland. Um, so development of, of, um, of oil palm on peat is, is to me total nonsense. So there are a couple of guidelines that the industry could start using um, that would help us to develop an, an oil palm industry that's much more in line with the, um, um, the social and environmental values that a lot of people uh, care about. There is a certain demand for, um, for vegetable oils in the world and, and oil palm happens to be a crop that produces um, vegetable oils pretty much uh, more effectively than any other crop in the world. So it's very unlikely that oil palm is going to go away. And if it's not going to go away, um, my bet is then to, to try to improve it. Ultimately, this is a story about money and consumption. This is a story about economics and the damages that can be incurred to supply a massive demand. All of us drive that demand by consuming products with palm oil. This is too big and complex of an issue to make any sort of tidy conclusion. But it's obvious that all of the biggest players in the palm oil industry still drive deforestation, whether they are members of the RSPO or not. Sometimes the simple truth of what is right gets lost in the complex details of a debate. And sometimes we humans have a hard time changing course, especially when large industries and sums of money are in play. And as suited business execs hold meetings and make promises while their profits rise, Indonesia burns and everybody chokes on its smoke. This is a very immediate and very finite problem. If things continue as they are, the forests of Sumatra will go up in smoke, sending toxic matter into the air and poisoning our own people. Noble species will lose their habitats and go extinct, and global warming will worsen. We must be able to find better ways to produce vegetable oil than burning down our own forests.